Hello and welcome to this introductory course titled Why Humanistic Management? My name is Ernst von Kimakowitz from the Humanistic Management Center and I of course also want to thank very much Jennifer Hancock of Humanist Learning Systems for enabling this course to uh, take place and to deliver it to you in this uh, online format. Um, we'll take a look at the contents first and I want to talk you uh, through what we're going to be doing for the following hour and we will first uh, look at an introduction and the business world we live in today. Um, from then we will move on to uh, generating some terminological and conceptual clarity because the framings and the terminologies we're using are, are central for understanding uh, what we're working on and what we're going to be talking about. Thirdly, then we're going to move on to looking at what humanistic management actually means. What is humanistic management in, uh, as, a, as a conceptual framework that we have defined in the Humanistic Management Center. And from there we are moving on to look at some practical dimensions of implementation. So what does this mean or what can this mean uh, for a business organization? And lastly, we're going to conclude uh, wrapping up um, by looking again at, at the previous four points and we'll just highlight the main aspects of those. Um, first, let me tell a little bit though about the work that we're doing at the Humanistic Management Center. Essentially, we're based on three work streams that are uh, mutually um, supporting each other and they are firstly creating knowledge, secondly disseminating and thirdly applying the knowledge that we uh, initially create. And uh, to give you some examples on the knowledge creation side, we are um, jointly with our sister organization, the Humanistic Management Network, um, uh, uh, editing a, a series of books called the Humanism in Business series at Palgrave Macmillan. And there's nine uh, volumes out already, and the 10th volume is coming out this week. So we're quite excited about seeing these uh, publications going strong. Uh, secondly, we're producing a series of working papers, the Humanism and Business Working Paper series, where we're publishing scholarly articles, um, it's partly before they are appearing in journals and partly we're just doing it to provide them online uh, within our website. The third area of knowledge creation is uh, more practitioner-oriented and journalistic writings. Uh, they are contributions to reports, uh, they are newspaper articles or interviews, also some uh, radio and video formats. And the last part is a set of presentations where we are taking the knowledge that we, that we research and that we build and wrap it up in, in presentations for lecture and talks and uh, probably I will also upload um, the presentation we're going through right now at some stage on our website so that you can have uh, continuous access there. The dissemination side is founded on partnerships with uh, conference organizers and universities mainly and those are uh, worldwide uh, institutions going from, from Asia, Africa, uh, North and South America and Europe and uh, we're doing teaching activities there at universities, we're doing conference talks, presentations and uh, engaging as much as we can to actually disseminate and to <clears throat> tell people about uh, the, the knowledge that we have created. And lastly, uh, what we're doing is we're offering advisory services and consulting in the area of applying the knowledge and that has been done as well with for-profit and also non-profit organizations. So let's, let's move on to the actual uh, content of this course though and uh, following this brief introduction uh, I want to introduce the, the overall topic uh, by looking at the business world we live in today. And for doing so, um, the, the first crucial part I think is to realize that, uh, that, that we're talking about a great success story here. If we're looking at the situation we're faced with, then we need to acknowledge that the combination of democratic government and market economies has had a hugely liberating effect on the individual and has created unprecedented wealth in the rich parts of the world. However, we are also facing a situation where the natural capacity of the planet as well as the distributional injustice of wealth is stretched to the point where we are biting the hand that feeds us. 
through the way we are conducting economic activities and running businesses, we are putting at risk the very foundation of the success story. We are putting at risk social cohesion and peace and the natural capacity of this planet, which we all need for our societies to continue to thrive. So in, in consequence, uh, I think we need to be aware that we're talking about the negative side effects of something that is a big success story. But we are at a point where these negative side effects have become too grave, too big to just be ignored. And that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about successfully and productively addressing the negative side effects of what is a great success story. If we're looking at the business world we live in, or this is more the world we live in, from a macro perspective, there's one organization that is doing great, uh, a, a great job, and they are called 100people.org. Now, what they're doing is they realize that whenever we are confronted with or that we're seeing uh, socioeconomic uh, data at a global scale, the figures are just too big for anyone to make sense out of it. We're seeing figures in the tens of billions, hundreds of millions, and it is very difficult to actually see what this means. So what they've done is a very simple statistics exercise by breaking down all those figures uh, to a level where we're imagining that the world were only 100 people. And the results you're getting are on the slide. And I won't look at all of them, um, but just to highlight a few, um, if the world were 100 people, there would be 78 having access to electricity, 22 would not have electricity. We would have uh, 48, so almost half of the world's population living on less than $2 a day, and half the children would live in poverty. We would have seven people with a college degree and 22 would share a computer or own a computer, which means on the other hand that 93% would not have any higher education and that <clears throat> 78 uh, of those 100 people would not have access to any kind of computing. Um, 17 would be illiterate. And uh, the most, uh, uh, you know, most fundamental and most worrisome uh, figure of them all, of course, is that one of those hundred people uh, would be dying of starvation, whilst 15 would be severely undernourished and 21 overweight. So I think this uh, breaking down the world uh, to, to 100 people really brings home the point that, that there's uh, no room for complacency. We need to look at, uh, at what can be done and we need to become better in, in improving the lives of those many, many people that are living under circumstances that are uh, frankly unacceptable for a world that is so full of wealth and prosperity. Now, if we're looking at, uh, at this at, in, in more, a little more detail on, on global wealth distribution, we find what economists call a champagne glass distribution. And what we're seeing here is a division of the world's population in quintiles. So there are five equal parts of 20% each. And we are finding that the richest 20% of the world's population share 82.7% of the world's income, whilst the poorest 20% of the world share 1.4% of the world's income. If we're drawing a line roughly at half and dividing the world in, in the uh, richer 50% and the poorer 50%, we're ending up with a figure of around 95% of the world's income, a little more than 95% of the world's income. Um, being shared by the top 50% and the remaining under 5% of global income is shared by the, by the remaining half of, of the world's population. So clearly, uh, distributional uh, questions regarding the, the world's wealth and the riches that we generate is, is an issue that is uh, dominant and that we need to address. In this context, I think it is important to realize that uh, no one actor alone will be able to successfully address these problems. If we're waiting for governments to find the solution on their own, I don't think it will happen. If we're assigning NGOs as uh, you know, great work they may be doing and as engaged as they are, the, the non-profit NGO sector, international organizations alone will not be able to do it. And equally, it would be wrong to, to expect business to do it uh, on their own. 
business by itself will also not be able to address and solve these problems. But what we need is we need active and constructive contributions of all societal sectors to address these problems. And what we have to admit is that we're currently seeing a situation where for the majority of the world's population, business is seen as part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And I think we need to reverse this and make sure that business acts as and is seen as part of the solution to these problems that we're having and is actively contributing jointly with other uh, societal groups and societal uh, factors to, to address these problems. I want to uh, end this small uh, section with, with a quote from someone who's under no suspicion of harboring, uh, you know, leftist tree huggers thoughts, uh, which is Warren Buffett, uh, one of the big investors and, and, and famous uh, finance gurus of today, uh, who says the rich are always going to say, you know, just give us more money and we'll go out and spend it and it will then all trickle down to the rest of you. But that has not worked the last 10 years and I hope the public is catching on. Now this quote is around 10 years old, so we've been uh, hearing the trickle down story for, for over 20 years now and it is not materializing. So I think we need to realize and we need to see that uh, by itself these uh, distributional problems will not find the solutions. We need to be more active and we need to find solutions uh, by, by taking action towards a more equitable sharing of the wealth that we have and that we generate in this world. If we're now looking a little closer to the business side, <clears throat> and we're, uh, I, I want to present two uh, sets of data here, two um, uh, studies that are being conducted on, an, on a regular basis. And the, the first of those is the Gallup Organizational Wellbeing Study, or, or more precisely the part on employee well-being and employee engagement that, uh, that the Gallup uh, group are, are conducting. And what they have found is that you can subdivide employees into three categories. Uh, firstly, the engaged, secondly, not engaged, and thirdly, actively disengaged employees. Now, by itself, I don't think this is really uh, such a surprise. The engaged employees are uh, people that work with passion and feel a profound connection to their company, and they drive innovation and move the organization forward. Uh, secondly, the not engaged are essentially checked out. They're sleepwalking through their workday. They're putting in time, but not energy or passion into their work. And the third part are the actively disengaged. They are employees which are not just unhappy at work, but they're busy acting out their unhappiness. And every day these workers undermine what their engaged co-workers accomplish. Uh, as I said, I think in itself this is not really surprising. You will always have people that are passionate and that like doing what they're doing and that will give their best and, and, uh, and move things forward. And you will always have those people who are playing it by the book. They do enough so that they can say we're, we're doing everything we're asked, um, but they will not walk the extra mile and they will not try to improve things. And you will inevitably have those people that are no matter what miserable and that don't like what they do and that need to show everyone that they don't like what they do. Now, the, the problem and the worrying part of this is not having these three categories, but it is the numbers and the percentages that are assigned to these three categories. If we're looking at the first part, the engaged employees, we find around 30% of the US workforce being engaged at work we find roughly 50% being not engaged at their work and we find the remaining 20% being actively disengaged at their workplace. So what this means is that 70% of the US workforce profoundly dislike what they do. I think this is bad news. This is bad news on two levels. It is firstly bad news for business because employers, companies, businesses, lose the vast majority of their workforce when it comes to engaging, when it comes to finding creative solutions, when it comes to walking the extra mile when necessary. Uh, this is all lost. They're not giving 
uh, their best. They are not simply simply not interested in in what they're doing at work, and the loss on the business side to this is substantial, to say the least. Um, but this is not the only point. I think it is also very sad on a personal level. I mean, we have to realize that this means that the vast majority of the workforce are profoundly unhappy with what they're doing, you know, anywhere between six and ten hours a day. Um, that, that is saddening. I mean, we're, we're talking about millions and millions of people here which are spending the majority of their lifetime doing things they don't enjoy. I, I don't want to be in that place. So we, we definitely have a challenge when it comes to employee engagement and when it comes to providing workplaces where people feel empowered and where people generate and develop a desire to engage with their workplace and at work. And that's that's one of the side of the story. That's that's the, the part on, on looking at employee engagement. But there's another study, as I said, I want to introduce two uh, sets of figures, which is more addressing the, the leadership question. And this is called the Edelman Trust Barometer. And what they're doing is they're assessing um, on a global level the credibility of spokespeople. So they're asking if uh, a leader from a certain uh, domain um, academic, technical experts, a person like yourself, a regular employee. Um, if a person makes a public statement, is that uh, credible? Is, do you trust the statement? And what we find is the biggest ever drop in the history of this, um, of this study in 2012 for CEOs and government officials or regulators. So the least trusted of the groups that have been analyzed here are business leaders and government leaders. And clearly that is worrying. If over 60% of the global public do not think statements by business leaders are credible, and over 70% do not think statements by political leaders are credible, then we do have a leadership problem on a global level. And the combination of these two points is, is really what leads us to think that we need a fundamentally new management paradigm. Uh, we cannot continue doing what we're doing and, and hoping for things to get better, but we need to rethink some fundamentals of how we conduct business, how we organize the global economy and what the role of management is therein. Um, Closing this section, uh, a, a quote that I find very telling uh, that is ascribed to, to various people, so I left out uh, any name for it, but it says that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. So business as usual will not solve the problems we face as a global community. We do need business as unusual. I uh, said that we're going through a, a uh, introduction from a macro perspective, that we're looking at the big picture and, and looking at the business world we live in and uh, so that we derive from there the, the rest of the presentation. And the next part is uh, looking at uh, terminological questions and, and conceptual questions to clarify what we're really talking about when we're talking uh, about CSR, about uh, business ethics, about corporate citizenship and, and similar terms that are um, uh, you know, used by, uh, by business and academia to, to describe the role of, of business in society and, and the aspirations uh, that we're having towards the role of business in society. So terminological clarity for the CSR debate. There's one single picture that I think really uh, describes or shows that uh, there are three different conceptions uh, in this debate that are often mixed and mingled together and we need to uh, separate them and we need to look at what's what uh, to gain a better picture of what, what we're trying to achieve. And those three terms are on one side compliance, secondly responsibility and thirdly philanthropy. And the pyramid is, uh, is a good, good depiction of this because it shows that uh, there's a hierarchy there, that there's a fundament uh, basis and that there's an icing on top. And uh, the, the basis, the fundamental part is uh, compliance, which is a must. Um, we cannot um, look at compliance as something optional. Uh, we need to look at compliance as, uh, as a must-have because compliance answers to the question of whether a business organization adheres to the law 
and to potentially self-set standards. So compliance is not really something that you do voluntarily, but compliance means that you accept the rule of law and that as a business organization, you're willing uh, to act within the rules of engagement. And uh, I want to jump to the top now because philanthropy is uh, the, the icing, as I said initially, um, on the cake. Philanthropy answers to the question of how you spend part of the more money that you've earned once you've earned it. So philanthropy is, is really a, a, an, an, an add-on, but the tough questions and the questions that responsibility really is looking at are the question of how you earn your money in the first place. Not so much the question of whether you earn your money within the legal requirements. You have to do that if you want to uh, accept the rule of law. It is also not so much the question of how you spend parts of the money once you've earned it, but the real questions of a corporate responsibility and the tough questions go to the core of a business activity. And they are asking how is the money earned of a business organization. So these are the three uh, levels and, and uh, terms that are, are often uh, used in, in ambiguous ways in the whole debate on, on, uh, on corporate responsibility, corporate citizenship and, and the likes. And I think it is important to know that there's a difference between, that there's a difference between these terms and that uh, they are not um, all the same although they are all interconnected. But to, to repeat, compliance is a, a must-have. It's the obligation to act within the rule of law. Um, responsibility is really addressing the questions of how do you earn money as a business organization, whilst philanthropy uh, is asking the question for how you spend part of the money once you've earned it. There's three uh, myths and misunderstandings I want to go through. Uh, I call them the myths and misunderstandings in the CSR debate uh, because it is, uh, I think, something where there's a lot of uh, arguments built around why we can't do this and why we can't do that. And, uh, and uh, empirically, you don't find that confirmed. Empirically, you find confirmed what we're going to look uh, at uh, over the next uh, um, a couple of slides as well. The, the first one is that the reason of being for a business organization is to maximize profits versus the reason of being for a business organization is to offer relevant goods and services to the benefit of wider society. The second pairing is that responsible conduct stands in conflict with profitability versus responsible corporate conduct lays the foundation for earning and sustaining long-term healthy profits. The third pairing then is that corporate responsibility can be assumed by philanthropic expenditure alone and we've touched upon that in the pyramid just now already versus uh, corporate responsibility is about how profits are earned and not only about how they are spent. And uh, I guess uh, you, you uh, will already expect that I'm uh, looking at the right side of the slide as, as the things that we find empirically confirmed and that make more, more sense uh, to me on an argument, uh, on, the, on the side of, of logical argument as well. And <clears throat> so what we're looking at is that uh, businesses uh, exist and have a reason of being through the services and goods that they offer to the benefit of wider society. Uh, secondly, that responsible corporate conduct is not in conflict with but actually lays a foundation for earning and sustaining long-term healthy profits. And thirdly, uh, the real questions of corporate responsibility are in the domain of how you're earning profits as a, as a business and not how you spend part of the profits once you've earned them. And uh, I'm, I'm having some, some quotes here on each of those three points. And the first one is by one of uh, Japan's great entrepreneurs, uh, founder of Kyocera, uh, Kazuo Inamori, uh, who said, too many people think only of their own profit, but business opportunity seldom knocks on the door of self-centered people. No customer ever goes to a store merely to please the storekeeper. I'm not sure if there's a lot uh, to be added to this, but, uh, but clearly it says that 
if you want to be successful as a business, you need to offer something that is of relevance to your customers and of benefit to wider society. If you're only looking at your own profit, if you're only running a business on a self-centered mode, uh, you are unlikely to have success in the long run and you are unlikely to survive as a business and you're not fulfilling the mission and the purpose of a business organization in the first place. The second part is that responsible corporate conduct lays the foundation for earning and sustaining long-term healthy profits. There I have a quote from Robert Bosch uh, who invented the spark plug and uh, founded Bosch who are today the world's largest um, automotive supplier. So they are a, a corporate giant uh, in today's terms. And what he said was, uh, it is not because I have a lot of money that I pay my workers well, but because I pay my workers well, I have a lot of money. And now today we're in a situation where minimal wages exist in many places of the world and uh, we're, we're having unionized labor. And so the, the question of actual uh, minimal pay levels, if you have a job, are not so much in question. But the, the fundamental insight here and the statement that he is making is that you as an organization prosper and succeed if you treat those that generate value jointly with you in a fair and good manner. So responsible corporate conduct understood as running your business, the core of your business operation in a manner that is fair, that is equitable and that provides a good deal and a beneficial relations to everyone involved is, is what Robert Bosch is really saying here translated into today's, um, today's situation. And so responsible corporate conduct is not in conflict with, uh, with healthy profits, but it lays the foundation for earning them. Lastly, we're addressing the uh, question of corporate uh, <coughs> um, about corporate philanthropy and we're saying that uh, corporate responsibility is about how profits are earned and not only about how they are spent. And uh, here I have a quote from Martin Luther King who said, philanthropy is commendable, but it must not cause the philanthropist to overlook the circumstances of economic injustice which make philanthropy necessary. And I, I think that's uh, really bringing the po point home uh, because what we are seeing here is that, uh, you know, lots of analogies can be built uh, with with the business context. Um, to, to give an example, um, perhaps, uh, you know, this would be saying first, first you sell uh, people mortgages they can't afford and then you um, donate money to social housing programs. Wouldn't it be better uh, to make sure that you only sell mortgages to people at the level that they can actually afford rather than afterwards having to uh, support social housing programs? So philanthropy is good. It's a nice thing to have philanthropists and we should be uh, you know, grateful and happy that, uh, that generous people donate uh, who have more than they need. But it should not lead us to think this can substitute questions that go to the core of why philanthropy is necessary. So these are some myths and misunderstandings that, that I wanted to go through on the CSR debate. And I think those are the three crucial ones. And um, we're now moving on to uh, the third part of this, uh, uh, this, this online course, um, asking what humanistic management actually means. And that's, uh, you know, the core of our work. We're called the Humanistic Management Center. So uh, we, we better have, have a view on what, uh, what humanistic management is. And uh, we've designed a process or a um, uh, approach, we call it the three-step approach to humanistic management that I want to share with you now. And we're having uh, the first step being the, the unconditional respect towards human dignity. And we'll go through all three steps uh, one by one over the following slides. And uh, the second part is the uh, integration of ethical reflection and managerial decision making. And then lastly, the third step is seeking legitimacy through stakeholder engagement. 
Now, looking at the first one, I think we, we rightfully expect our dignity to, respected, to be respected under all circumstances, also in business environments. Uh, this is something where, uh, you know, one of the few points maybe where, where philosophers across regions, across times, across cultures agree that we as humans have intrinsic value and that our dignity uh, deserves unconditional respect. At the same time, we find the situation, though, if we're looking at how we define managerial tasks, we, we frequently find that we're viewing people as instruments. We're viewing people as instrumental to economic processes. And that is uh, in, in, uh, in uh, conflict with uh, respecting people's dignity and viewing people as intrinsically worthy. Um, we are uh, expressing that quite quite clearly also through through terminology and I think terminology is is, is relevant here it it shows the mental framing the mental models that we're applying when we're talking about human resources or we're talking about human capital uh, rather than about human beings I I don't want to be a human resource and I'm, I'm most certainly not human capital I'm, I'm a human being and it would be nice if uh, I'd be treated as one. And uh, humanistic management uh, therefore embraces each person as an end in itself. We are all seen or we are seeing everyone as having intrinsic value. And uh, through that humanistic management lays a foundation for the alignment of business goals and societal aims. Because if we respect each person as an end in itself, um, we are automatically avoiding overly self-serving uh, business purposes and we're aligning business to serving society and that's what we really want to achieve and I want to give you a very simple example here um, which is from a Brazilian conglomerate called Semco and they, they are having uh, various different uh, mainly industrial operations and uh, they used to do body searches at their factory gates to make sure that uh, workers don't steal any equipment uh, from the company. And uh, they had a big management uh, reshuffle and an ownership change, a generational change actually. The son took over from the dad and, and he found that quite uh, horrible and he said what, what an undignifying experience this must be for our, for our workers to be under daily suspicion of stealing from the company. Uh, I, I don't think this is right. I think this is a very undignifying experience and I, I don't want to put my employees under the daily experience or the daily uh, suspicion that we expect them to steal from us. And so they did away with body searches and uh, guess what? Theft actually went down. Uh, people no longer uh, had a desire to steal or they no longer uh, thought they, they would want to uh, steal from their employer. Whereas when they need some piece of equipment, let's say they want to take a power drill home to, to hang up a picture at home, they just ask their supervisor, take the drill home and bring it back the next day. So uh, treat people as if they were responsible adults and there's a fairly big chance that most people will actually respond as responsible adults and uh, that's that's a very simple example uh, but a very profound and telling example I think that um, if you put people through undignifying experiences uh, they will not respond kindly whereas if you treat people um, with uh, respect towards their dignity and if you expect people to act as responsible adults in most cases they will and you will reap rewards from, from this uh, behavior, from this respect, uh, from, from your, your employees, from your workers. And this clearly relates back again to the situation uh, we looked at with the employee engagement study. So um, there are benefits to be had and clearly the status quo is not satisfactory. Having 70% of people um, not engaged or actively disengaged is not a situation any business can be happy with. The second part is uh, of or the second step of humanistic management is integration of ethical reflection in managerial decision making. Um, that's a bit of a mouthful, but it's not really that hard. Um, I think we need to move from corrective to integrative business ethics. And uh, what do I mean by this? We are too often observing business as usual and only if and when misconduct causes 
costly public outcry will corrective action be taken so um, what we're doing is uh, for for example we're we're uh, looking for the very cheapest supplier we can possibly get and then only when a building collapses when a roof falls down um, and there's a big public outcry and people start boycotting my my goods uh, will I start looking at maybe uh, sourcing my my intermediary goods from suppliers that actually earn enough money to provide a fair deal and safe working conditions to their employees you know we're we're uh, trying to take shortcuts on safety equipments and only if and when an oil platform blows up are we going to be willing to invest in state-of-the-art uh, health and safety equipment. Um, so we're really creating a situation where we're uh, taking shortcuts, trying to uh, do things in ways that are uh, bound to break at some point. And then when they break, we're going, oh, whoa, 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 how bad is this? Uh, now let's try and fix it. And we're having some CSR department or the corporate citizenship people who are then supposed to fix it. So we're operating very much on a corrective model. And uh, we think in humanistic management that much better than this corrective model, it would be to have an integrative view of business ethics and to integrate ethical reflection and consideration into management decisions so that we build things in a way that they don't break in the first place, rather than waiting for them to break and then having to fix them. So humanistic management demands the integration of ethical reflection into managerial decision making. And integrating ethical considerations in management decisions means building fundamentally sustainable businesses from the core. So what we're doing here is we're relating uh, back to the pyramid that we looked at earlier, where we're saying the really tough questions of responsibility are addressing the core business activities. They're asking the question of how do I earn my money? What decisions do I take? What managerial decisions do I take <clears throat> in, within my core business activities? And when I allow ethical considerations to gain some space in these decisions regarding the core of my business activities, that's the point where I can start to build fundamentally sustainable businesses. Moving to the third point, uh, seeking legitimacy through stakeholder engagement. This really is an extension of the second point in many ways, because what we're looking at is that even if you uh, do with best intentions, integrate ethical considerations into management decisions, you can make honest mistakes. Uh, no one can uh, claim to not make, make those mistakes. You can have the best intentions at heart. You can want to take a responsible decision, but you can be wrong. And one of the ways of, of mitigating the risk of going wrong there is to actually talk to those people who are affected by your management decisions. And that's what is broadly labeled as stakeholder engagement. And if we're looking at the uh, you know, reality that we find on the ground, then we see that stakeholder engagements often disappoint all parties involved. And the reason for that is not so difficult to, to understand. Uh, the reason is that stakeholder claims are not recognized as having intrinsic value, but are seen as instrumental to business aims that are unrelated to the actual stakeholder claim. So what we're having is, to, to give you an example here, what we're, what we're looking at, for example, if, if you are an NGO that uh, supports uh, health and safety issues for workers and uh, you're finding yourself in a in a stakeholder dialogue with a, with a business organization and but you realize quite quickly that there is actually not really a whole lot of genuine interest in improving the working conditions of of the workers there's not really a whole lot of interest in in the reason of why you are as a as a stakeholder or as a representative of stakeholders uh, in this dialogue and so obviously you check out you say like, what am I here for? We're, we're, we're not here to talk about the actual issue. We're not here to look into improvements, but we're, we're basically just here to, uh, to, to find ways of not changing anything. <laughs> and that, that is not the reason why you engage in stakeholders. So um, stakeholder dialogues or stakeholder engagements often disappoint because oftentimes the, the stakeholder claims are not recognized 
as as having intrinsic value and there is a lack of genuine willingness to engage with the substance of the claim that is presented. Now, in humanistic management, stakeholders have a right to be heard and their, concern, and their concerns are genuinely taken serious and viewed as having intrinsic value. And, and what we find time and again confirmed em empirically is that uh, successful stakeholder engagements or in successful stakeholder engagements, the power of the better argument supersedes factual power. So what this means is that uh, for stakeholder engagements to succeed, you have to allow arguments to be heard and you have to allow the power of the better argument to succeed and to draw consequences from that. And um, a, a business example I would like to present here is one company that is sort of the, the poster boy for, for stakeholder engagement. They're called Novo Nordisk and they're the world's largest uh, producer for uh, medical insulin. And um, they are also one of the very, very few large global business organizations who have a board position for stakeholder engagement. And for them, it is very clear. They, they state over and over again on their website in corporate publications and talks that senior executives give that to them, stakeholder engagement is a way to learn about future business trends. It is a way to learn about how their business is affecting um, civil society and their clients and it is a way for them to develop and innovate whilst mitigating potential um, and negative externalities that their activities may create. And they conclude that through their stakeholder engagement they are more likely to reach solutions that are beneficial to all parties involved and that provide the grounds for ongoing business success. So the third part is uh, gaining legitimacy through stakeholder engagement. And if we're summarizing this again, uh, the three points of humanistic management are firstly, the unconditional respect towards human dignity. Secondly, the integration of ethical reflection and managerial decision making. So rather than uh, waiting for things to go wrong and then fix them, uh, we say it is smarter to build things in a way that they don't break in the first place or at least not break so easily in the first place. And then the third step, uh, seeking legitimacy through stakeholder engagement, is a safety net, if you want, um, uh, against making honest mistakes in the second part. So even if you um, may be wrong from time to time, uh, respecting or integrating ethical reflection into managerial decision making, um, you, you build an additional safety net by engaging with those uh, people, with those interests that are affected by your management decisions and, and just uh, jointly uh, share responsibility with, with them and, and find a solution that is acceptable to all parties involved. And uh, I am closing, as you can see by now, uh, all the all the sections with with uh, some some quotes. And this one is uh, by Peter Drucker, who is one of the uh, very few people I think that that truly deserve the the label of management guru. And uh, what what he has said, uh, one of of the many uh, incredibly wise things that he has said, uh, is that there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. And and I think in many ways this is descriptive of uh, of uh, business uh, as we as we observe. Uh, it today in, in many aspects we are obsessed with ever greater efficiency gains and we are not asking the fundamental questions enough. We are not spending enough time asking whether something is worthwhile doing in the first place and we are asking far too much how we can squeeze out the little last efficiency gain. So um, uh, as, as Peter Drucker said, um, it's pretty useless uh, to do efficiently that which should not be done at all. So we've had a look at the macro picture at uh, the business world today and we then moved on, on to uh, look at some terminological questions, uh, the pyramid where we said like uh, that, uh, that um, 
excuse me, that uh, the, the foundation is really compliance, uh, which is an, a must. It's an obligation if you want to accept the rule of law and act within it. Uh, next come responsibility, which is addressing the core of your business activities and the question of how you earn money. And thirdly, then, is uh, corporate giving or philanthropy, where you're looking at how parts of the earnings that you've made are being spent. And uh, we then looked at what humanistic management actually is and briefly went through our three-stepped approach, looking at firstly, um, uh, respect, unconditional respect for human dignity as the foundation, then the uh, moving away from a corrective uh, towards an integrative business ethic, and lastly, expanding this uh, integrative ethic uh, by engaging with, with your, your stakeholders as a business organization. And from here, uh, we want to go to the uh, practical dimensions or look at some um, more practical dimensions of implementation. And uh, that's what the fifth part now is is on. And um, I've got some bad news for you there, or some good news, I would hope, um, because concrete activities need to emerge from within a business rather than being developed externally. I think, uh, you know, external guidance, moderation, procedural support can be very helpful, but essentially it is a case that only if the people in an organization stand behind efforts in humanistic management will they bear fruit. Um, this is not comparable to uh, the rollout of a new IT system where you can get external consultants and they um, you know, update the software on all the machines in the firm and then there's a PowerPoint deck explaining what's new and, and things work from then on. Uh, this is not how this works. Um, what we're talking about here is much deeper, more profound, and it goes to the, the, the core of behavioral questions of, of individuals and the organization overall. So I don't think it is very productive to, uh, to expect external consultants to be able to deliver on this. Uh, what external consultants can do is they can provide guidance, they can moderate and they can provide procedural support. They can take a very uh, relevant and helpful facilitator's role, but they cannot uh, prescribe what is to be done. And in that sense, uh, what I'm doing over the next slides now is to provide some questions and to look at a framing that, that I think uh, can help to think around these questions. And, and the framing really is that we have three domains of activities and uh, they go from the, from the, you know, have a kind of an onion uh, shape where you go from the, from the individual to the organizational and then expanding it to the systemic level. And as I said, I've just got three questions um, that uh, we can raise uh, within those uh, three domains and on the individual level and, and they're exemplary, those questions. So there's many, many more and, and you would have to find out in your organization which are the relevant ones. But these are some that appear in a lot of organizations. And the first one on the individual level would be around personal well-being or in one word, uh, happiness. And uh, so it is a question of asking in the organization if, if the work is conducive to its members leading happy lives. Um, is, is what I do as my job, what I'm doing at work, is that actually in the way of myself leading a happy life or is it conduct conducive? Is it, is it supporting me in leading a happy life? A second question um, in, uh, on the individual level is the question of integrity. Um, are members of the firm encouraged and expected to say what they do and do what they say? And uh, crucially, do they leave, live up to that aspiration? And the third part, our third question here on the individual level is uh, around caring. Do members of an organization care for and support each other? So are we having a, a corporate culture where if, if someone's done early with a job, they, they uh, pretend being busy so that they don't have to do anything? Or do we have a, a culture where um, if I have some space 
um, I, I seek to support my colleagues. Uh, if I see that a colleague is struggling with something uh, and, and I've been in the same situation and, and mastered it uh, not too long ago, will I go and, and offer my help or will I uh, let that person struggle by themselves and, and see whether they succeed or not? So do the members of an organization care and support for each other, uh, care for and support each other is a third question you may raise on the individual level. If we're looking at the organizational level, again, uh, three questions here. Uh, the first one on uh, cultural alignment. So uh, business change, uh, business environments change. And the question is, does the business maintain within these changing environments, uh, does the business maintain a joint vision and act based on shared values? Uh, the second question would be the question of purpose. So uh, the, the purposeful organization and the question here is, does the organization serve a purpose that relates to society at large and are its members aware and supportive of it? And uh, this is really one of the first questions I ask uh, when I'm talking to, to uh, members of the business community, be it clients or at, at conferences, uh, is, is the simple question is what, what is the purpose of your organization? And, and the vast majorities of answers you get are not answering the question. People tell me what they do and not why they do it. So um, I, I'll give you a little example here. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think anyone ever goes to a hardware store uh, to buy a hammer and a nail. I, I, I don't want to buy a nail. I go to the hardware store and buy a hammer and a nail because I want to hang up a picture. So what I want, the purpose of this company that manufactures hammers and nails is not to produce hammers and nails, but the purpose of their organization is to enable people to have a comfortable home where they can uh, hang up pictures that they like seeing. Um, so this simple example, I think, brings the message home. You need to think as a business organization what your purpose is, what your offer is to society at large. And for this, it is not enough to simply know what you're doing on a technical level, but you need to know why you're doing it and whom you're offering what through doing it. And uh, the third part on there, or the third question on the organizational level is that of stakeholder engagement. Um, so does an organization know its stakeholders and is it engaging with them? And we've uh, seen that as the third uh, element or the third step in humanistic management um, <clears throat> that we are um, having a, a very relevant role here as, as our a, a task to fulfill by, by engaging with stakeholders and by ensuring that what a business organization does is aligned to societal expectations and that the effects a business organization has on um, its stakeholders um, is, uh, is, is uh, that there's awareness at least of the effects that are there and that when there are negative effects, negative externalities and then people have concerns with, with the effects of business activities that there's a channel to be heard and that these voices are taken serious. The third domain of uh, practical dimensions is on the systemic level and on the systemic level uh, we, we again have three uh, questions which uh, would firstly be that on business partners. Uh, who do you partner with and why as a business organization? So is there any form of ethical screening, of responsibility screening? Do you look at um, a code of conduct of your suppliers and client organizations? And do these um, assessments have any impact on the choices you make regarding your suppliers uh, and your uh, customers? And uh, why is this systemic? Because if you as a business organization um, are acting responsibly, are acting aligned to principles of humanistic management, then you can strengthen other organizations that are striving to do the same. And through doing that, you generate a whole ecosystem of successful companies uh, that are doing business differently. And through that, you're generating a, a systemic impact. Uh, a second option or a second question is around social intrapreneurship. And that really asks the question is uh, if, if it is possible in your organization to uh, learn from social entrepreneurship and to allow for innovative business models 
that uh, primarily aim to serve a social and or environmental mission. So is it possible in your organization to come up with an idea that is not based on uh, firstly uh, self-serving ideas of, <clears throat> of, of creating additional revenue, but that is firstly based on saying like, let's fulfill an unfulfilled social and or environmental need. And then in the next step, we'll see how we earn money with that. Because if we truly manage to fulfill an unfulfilled need, there will be a way to do that profitably in, in the vast majority of cases. So do you allow as an organization for social intrapreneurship activities would be a second question that has systemic impact because you're triggering transformational processes and in industries through that. And the third question is around lobbying. Um, uh, most uh, larger businesses or medium-sized businesses upwards are engaged in some form of lobbying. And uh, the question is, what do you use your lobbying powers for? And are you using them partly as well also to, to raise the bar, to uh, raise the, the bar on social and environmental questions and to create through regulatory uh, initiatives or self-regulatory initiatives and the influence you have on them to create a level playing field at a higher level. And uh, that would be a question of using uh, lobbying powers uh, in service of societal benefit. So these are the three uh, questions I wanted to pose on the systemic level. And we are um, almost done. And uh, so I just want to conclude now and summarize the four um, areas that we've been talking about in this introductory hour on humanistic management. And we're going to uh, the conclusion, uh, which is uh, labeled as uh, we need business as unusual, uh, because as we've seen earlier, um, expecting different results by doing the same thing uh, is unlikely to happen. So firstly, the business world we live in. Um, as I said, market economies and free enterprise have a great liberating potential for mankind, but we need to use them more wisely. I think that is really the main lesson here, that we are having a fantastic tool, um, but we're not really smart in using it. And so humanistic management proposes that we think around ways to use markets more wisely. Secondly, terminological clarity. There, I would argue that the tough questions on corporate responsibility are not if you adhere to the law, nor how you spend part of your earnings, but the tough questions on corporate responsibility are how you earn your money in the first place. Coming to the third point, what is humanistic management? Um, human dignity deserves unconditional respect, as we've seen as the first step in humanistic management. And this respect can only be warranted based on, firstly, as the second step, integrative business ethics rather than corrective ethics. And secondly, doing that in combination with a third step in humanistic management, which is stakeholder engagement. On the practical dimensions, to close the, the summarizing conclusion here, a, a business needs to consider activities that impact the individual, the organization, and the system. However, concrete activities need to emerge from within the firm. So uh, these are the four summarizing slides of the four uh, main areas we went through over the last uh, 50, five almost uh, minutes, almost one hour now. So we're, we are actually on time. And I want to close this presentation with a quote from uh, one of the great American entrepreneurs, uh, Henry Ford, who said, a business that makes nothing but money is a poor business. So again, thank you very much for joining uh, me on this course uh, titled Why Humanistic Management? Uh, now, there's a lot of uh, opportunities to interact and I would be really excited to get your feedback, whatever it may be, um, either in the forum um, on humanist learning systems. Um, use that also for additional questions you may have. Uh, you can also email me directly under ernst at humanisticmanagement.org. Um, and take a look at our website where we're offering a whole range of, of presentations and information on events that we do and uh, where we present our work. And you can all find that under humanisticmanagement.org. And for me now, it is time to say goodbye. 
to uh, thank you very much for uh, sitting in this course and I hope it has been uh, interesting and uh, perhaps even uh, inspiring and, and fun for you to, to sit through this hour. And uh, I want to wish you a, a, a very good day and um, please dare to care. Goodbye. <laughs>